Okay, so I think we'll we'll um, we'll launch the evening. I want to say hello, welcome to the future of food, which is celebrating not only National Hedgerow Week, but it's also this week National Plant Health Week. And we're here in partnership with our good friends, the Legal Eagles from uh, McFarland's. I can see Praveen laughing there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight, especially all our volunteer tree wardens and our young tree champions and all our supporters across the country. My name is Sarah Long and I'm CEO of the Tree Council, which is a national charity that brings everybody together for the love of trees and hedgerows. And tonight the conversation is all about hedgerows and how important they are for wildlife, for pollination, carbon storage, flood alleviation, all the kinds of benefits that so many of you will already know about. But it's also tonight very much about the future of food. And the Tree Council has been working more and more closely with farmers and the farming community. And thanks to DEFRA and the National Lottery and our Jubilee partners and the Queen's Green Canopy, we've planted more than 100 kilometers of hedgerow over the past two planting seasons. And just to help you visualize that, that's a hedge that would stretch from Liverpool to Manchester and back again. So fantastic um, to see that great new hedge happening. Tonight, we're gonna to look at some big questions um, What's the future of food, not only for humans, but also for wildlife? What land do we as a nation have available for growing? How do we use that land? How can we leave it in better shape for the next generations? And how can we engage everybody in the process of, of food growing, in the growing process? We've got four brilliant guests with us this evening, sharing their knowledge and their experience and hopefully helping us answer some of those questions. So welcome this evening to Praveen Gopalan, Tom Lafford, Kate Forrester, and George Lamb. Praveen is Head of Sustainability at McFarland's. Um, he's guiding their environmental and social practice, and he's gonna say uh, a few words of welcome after me. Uh, Tom is a leading light in DEFRA's land use project team. And I heard him speak recently at a conference at the Oval, and he gave an absolutely brilliant kind of top level perspective of what's going on. I learned a lot, and I'm sure there's going to be some thought provoking questions coming out of what he says. Um, Kate, Kate Forrester, she's a market gardener and co-founder of Four Acre Farm at Ringwood in Hampshire. She's also an awesome chef. We went with our Tree Council Jubilee partners uh, to do a special Trees Love Care Day um, over the summer. And Kate cooked us the best ever herb and vegetable soup that you can ever imagine. The flavours in it were absolutely awesome. So we'll be hearing from um, Kate all about what uh, she's doing at Four Acre Farm. And then George, George Lamb. George began his career as a very successful radio and TV presenter. Then he co-founded Grow, um, a charity which engages young people in growing food and engaging with the outdoors. And then he went on and he co-founded Wild Farmed, uh, which is all about regenerative farming and now provides Mark Suspensers and others with flour. Um, so I'm gonna hand over in just one second, but one bit of housekeeping. If you do have questions, we're gonna handle questions, come in with questions a bit later towards the end. Do put them in the Q and A box rather than in the chat box. Uh, makes it easier for us to um, sort, sort them towards the end. And Will's going to, my colleague Will uh, Fitzpatrick, who's on our Hedgerow team is gonna help with those questions too. So Praveen, I'm gonna hand over to you. I know you'd like to say a few words. Sarah and other panelists, thank you very much for hosting the session. This is brilliant. And also thank you for all of you who have joined us from across the UK, especially now that Sarah has explained, um, well, described Kate's cooking, which has made all of us a little bit hungrier. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to take too long. Essentially, I'm from uh, McFarland's and we've been working with the Tree Council for a few years now. Over the last few years, we've done quite a lot of pro bono legal advice for them. And through that, we've uh, worked on, say, a community community tree planting scheme, which resulted in over 170,000 trees planted across the UK. But given it's hedgerow week, I should also mention that that project led to about uh, 25 kilometers of hedgerow across the UK. Uh, we also supported the Tree Council's Close the Gap scheme, which led to 50 kilometers of new hedgerow and 25 kilometers of existing hedgerows being restored. Uh, but it's not just been a us giving to the Tree Council, it's been a very mutually beneficial relationship. 
we joined as a Jubilee partner last year. And since then, the Tree Council have had a few information sessions for us. So we had a session on the law of trees, which has been extremely useful for some of my colleagues that work on that specific area. Uh, we've also had uh, the Tree Council come in and take us on lunchtime walks around our office. We're in central London, we walk past these trees, never really looked at them, but then through the, head, uh, the Tree Council, we walked around, had a look, got to understand those trees. So it's been really beneficial and it's been a very um, holistic relationship as well because uh, the Free Council has given us knowledge that has been beneficial for some of our colleagues, for example, those that work on property or natural capital. It's helped us with uh, engaging with our colleagues, uh, so with a lot of the well-being, walking out during lunchtime, and it also helps us give back to the community and the environment. So it's been mutually beneficial, and we hope it will continue over the next few years as well. So thank you, Zara and Cole. Oh, thank you, Praveen. Uh, thank we, you. we love working with you guys, so it's a, it's a really great partnership. Um, now we're going to pa pass the battle over to uh, Tom from uh, DEFRA's land use team. He's going to talk to us about the bigger picture. We're going to go off camera and leave you, Tom, to take the screen. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation today. Uh, so I'm Tom Lafford. I'm a civil servant. Um, I work in the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, where um, I'm the head of land use change and uh, my team um, is leading uh, the research analysis and policy work that's feeding into something called the land use framework, which you may have heard of. I'm going to focus my remarks on that. But while while it's front of mind, given that it was just mentioned, I think I'm definitely going to have to book one of those tree walks. I'm uh, uh, one of those people who likes to sort of remind colleagues of their surroundings. And I'm forever trying to make jokes about the hornbeams that surround our um, our office and the law. Um, surrounding uh, uh, those things as a cure for tiredness and, and stress that no one seems to get. So I think I'll have to take um, all my colleagues on one of those uh, those walks if I can get on organised. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna restrict my remarks uh, to the kind of big question of why government right now uh, is looking to produce a um, a framework for the use of land in England. Um, I'll start with a little focus on the kind of tree side of that and then broaden out to some of the some of the bigger pictures that are um, front of mind um, for my ministers um, and the colleagues I work with across DEFRA group um, which has already been mentioned uh, um, is one of the you know, provides through research grants some of the um, some of the funding for great organizations like this as well as being um, a large delivery um, organization so I think perhaps the starting point should be uh, government's ambition for uh, tree planting, um, which has crystallised over the last uh, couple of years into um, a target to increase tree cover across England to 16.5%. And I'll set that in context of current land uses in a moment. But um, I recently uh, um, had the opportunity to um, uh, attend the launch of a, a Royal Society report on multifunctional landscapes and you know old institutions like that um, have the ability to take this really kind of long view and they they started uh, by comparing the target to the um, 17th century New Forest Act uh, um, that mandated the creation of the, that enormous beautiful forest to supply um, the Royal Navy and I think the need to take that that really long view um, uh, is one of the critical reasons that sits behind uh, um, government kind of pausing and thinking about uh, how it delivers all the things it wants to achieve um, on what is a relatively small island. Um, so there is also, in addition to that long term view, uh, being one of the most important drivers of this piece of work. Um, there's also the kind of simple picture that uh, England is not a very large country and for the purposes of my remarks I am focusing primarily on England because the majority of environmental policy at least um, is devolved um, so the majority of my job um, it, in that respect is about what happens in England um, I spend a lot of time working with uh, um, civil servants and ministers from the devolved governments as well we can talk about if you'd like to. Um, so just to uh, 
briefly set out some of the kind of facts and figures behind this. Um, we talk about this as a small crowded island. What does that actually mean? And what does that mean for the context of the kinds of changes that um, government is trying to achieve at the moment, the kinds of long-term change across our, across our landscapes? So England, roughly 13 million hectares um, of land in England. Um, we live on a very, very small chunk of that. Um, the urban area uh, in England is about 13% of the land, uh, less than 2 million hectares, um, uh, little dots across, uh, across the landscape. Then existing woodland, roughly 10%, 1.3 million hectares. Um, then you've got uh, a small category of uh, um, current land uh, cover or types of land uh, that where you can't deliver much of this change are mountainous landscapes, our bogs, uh, coastal habitats, roughly 5%. Um, and then you've got the biggest chunk, agricultural land, 70% of England, north of 9 million hectares. Um, so most of our landscape is agricultural. We do not have very much wild landscape in England anymore. A bit more in Scotland, a little bit more in Wales, but still not very much. So the majority of the ambitious changes that this government is trying to achieve in England to meet uh, our statutory objectives um, has to be achieved on agricultural land. And that means you've got to strike a balance across multiple objectives. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about those multiple objectives and how um, does that feed into the land use framework? So I think the big thing that I want to pause on uh, is uh, some of the new sources of demand for land in England that both result from government policy or um, are the kind of big factors that uh, I as a civil servant or perhaps you uh, um, uh, working and delivering things for your for your business or thinking about uh, um, the drivers of choice on your land are being buffeted by. To start with the new sources of demand that come from government policy, though, um, first off, you have the recent shift from uh, the 80% emissions reduction target in the Climate Change Act, as it was originally set, down to net zero. Um, we need to go all the way down to zero emissions, uh, which has completely altered the picture of the demand to meet our climate targets, our domestic and our international objectives on the land in England. Because there are some industries that can't be decarbonized uh, fast enough, um, there is a need to go further faster on the land. Um, and that, that is not only the case for um, carbon sequestration through tree planting, uh, hedgerow planting, different forms of, of agriculture. Um, it's also these very extensive um, energy infrastructure uh, land uses, um, things like solar, uh, things like new grid, um, and looking further ahead to um, things like uh, um, direct air capture of, of carbon, all of these things uh, reasonably large footprints, um, often very constrained in the land that is appropriate for them as well, um, and some really enormous uh, opportunities for um, businesses that want to mix land uses as well. So you have that first source of demand the, um, uh, that arrives from our net zero objectives. Then the other side of the Climate Change Act, um, uh, the need uh, to set out a plan to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, one of the responsibilities of my department, one of the um, most important um, objectives that sits behind the land use framework. So on that, I think um, there's been a real step change in uh, um, the understanding in the research community and in government um, and the level of and uh, quality of evidence coming back from farmers, landowners, about what climate change is currently and is likely to do to um, the land in England, what it's likely to mean for um, what kind of crops you can grow where. Um, and that picture has moved from a picture of 
you know, broadly scoped uncertainties that uh, um, uh, meant you had to be kind of chaste, modest in the, uh, your expectations of how long term you could actually think about uh, land use decisions to reasonably clear risks, um, which can inform some big choices. Uh, and that is a that is a major constraint on uh, what can be delivered where um, a uh, fast growing uh, um, spruce uh, um, plantation in the south of England now um, you know there'd be many good reasons not to do that but uh, one would be that becoming uh, less a sink for carbon uh, and more of a fire risk as uh, summer spikes in temperature like last year start to become a frequent occurrence across the summer. Um, and then finally, the incredibly ambitious targets under the Environment Act. Um, I mentioned the, the one for trees earlier, there are, all, there are equally ambitious um, targets on water, on species, all of which require changes in land use, changes in land management practices. And again, as I mentioned, a lot of this has to be delivered um, on the 70% of land that is currently agricultural. And that means uh, there is a need to share those uses to deliver multifunctionality at a landscape scale. Now, there's also, before bringing this to a close, there's also the trends that are beyond uh, government policy, the things that constrain the choices that you'll be making about the land that you manage or that you'll notice landowners and land managers uh i'm making around you uh to start with food security i mean uh um this is an area where government has objectives uh they were set out in the food strategy and we um we report on those regularly um uh there there is a a real changing international picture of food security as uh um trade policy shifts lead to uh um you know, perhaps less of the um, ability to rely in the very long term on on free trade um and as the impact of climate change conflict across uh the bread baskets of europe africa um lead us to question where we might get some of our food foodstuffs from um so some big uh trends beyond the influence of individual governments and beyond our shores affect the choices that we make about our land. Um, there's also the picture of technology change and behavior change. Um, one of the things that government is trying to do with the land use framework is to capture um, the way in which uh, our eating habits are already changing. Um, and what that means about uh, what it will take to feed a population healthy um, over the coming years. Um, whether technology change will drive um, uh, forms of intensification that are genuinely sustainable, um, whether vertical farming, for example, has a much larger role to play in some calorie and value types, um, and whether alternative proteins um, could start to play a very large role. All of these questions um, have to be grappled with so that we can take a meaningful long-term view. Now, to to finish um, uh, on the what and when, um, what is government going to produce? When is it going to produce it? So um, we're working, uh, um, my team, towards uh, publication of the land use framework this year. Um, I'd say we're reasonably advanced on an understanding of what it takes to deliver DEFRA's objectives, the ones I've been focusing on today. Um, and we're just starting to work through uh, the objectives of other departments that I touched on, at least on the energy side, but all those big land uses that come from traditional sources of demand, your, your traditional sources of economic infrastructure and housing demand, um, that need to be balanced, needs to be considered in this uh, um, framework for land use in England. So expectation will publish uh, later this year. Um, uh, and that that document will be the basis for um, a kind of national conversation through organisations like the like the Tree Council um, about what you take from uh, what we publish in the document, um, what you think it means for your land, um, and where government should go next with um, with the strategy. 
All right, thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion to come. Please do start um, chugging questions in the, in the Q&A. Thanks. Great, thanks very much, Tom. I can see already there are some questions, but we'll, we'll leave them um, a little bit uh, longer. I think you mentioned a couple of times that how, how far you have to look ahead. And I know, um, you know, with, with, with your role and with trees, uh, tree time is so very different that you're, you're not only looking decades, sometimes centuries ahead, and how can you get it right all the time? So it is absolutely fascinating. So th thanks very much. I'm going to um, move over to, to Kate now, who's going to give us a, a, a sort of hands-on case study. I mean, I would call it groundbreaking, but it really isn't that. It's absolutely <laughs> not that. Um, and Kate, Kate is actually um, had a terrible tragedy with her laptop today, uh, had a fight with her cat. Is that right? Uh, the cat had a fight with a cup, maybe. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, OK. <laughs> Which landed on the laptop. Anyway, we'd, we'd love um, to hear more about your inspirational journey at, at Four Acre Farm. Over to you, Kate. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't have my... There we go. That's it. Will's doing this for me on the slides. Thank you, Will. Um, hello, I'm Kate, and I run a small market garden or micro farm uh, selling to local families, shops and restaurants restaurants are four acres comprises of just over one acre no dig veg market garden a mixed fruit orchard with her beds and a two acres of habitat creation including ponds a mini food forest and a wildflower meadow along with my business partner molly taylor our focus is to link up with the local community to educate them about how food is grown give people access to locally grown produce, teach practical skills and engage people of all ages with the natural world. We are set up as a community interest company so that we can operate our business and also apply for grants to let us um, reach more people with uh, free sessions. Our growing practices are focused on soil health and creating a healthy ecosystem on the site we are not organically certified, but never use any man-made chemicals. We sprayed uh, microbial compost teas and biodynamic preparations, and sometimes we use seaweed as a mulch. Um, so five years ago, I learned about the so-called Green Revolution post-World War II, which flooded our landscapes with man-made chemical fertilizers and biocides which claim to benefit farmers by increasing yields, um, which obviously on the surface seems to work and people were naturally sold. Um, however, we are now living with the repercussions of these methods and heavy tillage of the earth, and we are left with broken soil, a severe decline in biodiversity and an increase in chronic health issues, as we think a result of nutrient poor foods. So um, obviously agriculture can also play a huge role in climate change. Um, regenerative agriculture takes many forms and the rise of uh, no dig small scale market gardens like ours is one of the pathways um, that an increasing number of people are turning to. Um, it seems to be a lot of people like myself and Molly who have no background in agriculture or families connected to land management or food production. So my background is a, is a private chef and um, I owned a small catering company in London. But when I decided to leave London to move to the Dorset countryside, I began growing veg in my own garden. I'd never really had a garden before um, in London, so and I'd often thought about trying it. But um, it started to make me think about the link between big ag um, and the surrounding uh, tilled or bare fields and my own experience of sourcing ingredients either shipped uh, or flown from abroad, wrapped in plastic or grown conventionally, or all three. Um, other chefs and my clients rarely talked about where produce was coming from or whether it was organic. I used to think it was um, an elitist word that just meant that it was more expensive. Um, animal welfare, of course, was spoken of, but not vegetables or land use. Um, we do the next slide, please. I had, um, so this is Dorset countryside that I moved to and there's the nice hedgerows on the right there, but I'd always thought that the countryside was beautiful, but I, I started to see it um, quite differently when I was walking around it in vast fields of kind of monoculture with little life in the actual fields, except perhaps at the edges. 
Um, luckily near our cottage was a nature reserve of huge thickets of mixed hedgerows and trees, which were like buzzing with many birds. And we even had turtle doves up there. Um, but after my first year um, on the in that place, I decided um, that I was wanting to do something different. And an idea formed in my mind of a project that might blend my cooking experience and veg growing to engage the local folk with the food that they eat and truly um, get to understand like about where it comes from and also how to cook it and make it taste good. So um, this had never truly come into my school education with only pathetic attempts at bread making and home ed. Um, but my, my love of cooking came only from my own desire to eat more exciting stuff than my mum was cooking me. Um, so when I dug one bed in my garden, I realized it was super hard work and I came across Charles Dowding's No Dig Method. Um, I contacted him and I was lucky enough to be accepted to volunteer with some good timing. And I started volunteering at Homemakers, which is in Somerset. I didn't at this point realize what a legend Charles is. Um, Charles has developed the no dig method for over four decades. Um, he's a master veg grower. Um, so about no dig, it, if you don't know, it aims to leave the soil ecology alone as much as possible. We avoid digging, which can destroy the structure and expose the microbes below to the surface light, killing them and also releasing carbon. Until I worked for Charles, I knew nothing about soil biology, apart from worms, obviously. Um, Charles showed me that the plants grew healthy. Uh, they were strong with disease resistance and very little insect pressure due to this practice of mulching the soil with his homemade compost once a year and by keeping roots in the ground year round and providing mixed habitat for wildlife. I learned that the plants did not need chemical fertilizers in healthy soil and that man-made chemical fertilizers disrupt the natural uh, processes in the soil by acting like a sort of drunk food, making the plants look good on a shelf, but in fact are lacking in vital minerals and nutrients. In healthy soil, a natural function occurs with plant roots releasing exudates, which attracts microbes and makes the nutrients and minerals already present in the soil bioavailable to the plant to then take up. This symbiotic nature of soil and plant life was so fascinating to me and it made total sense. So obviously nature knew what it was doing. Um, can we do the next slide, please? Um, after two years with Charles, I began to look for land on which to start our project. A move to Ringwood and a fortuitous introduction to Colin Andrews led me to a four acre slice just outside the small town of Ringwood. Uh, Colin himself remembered uh, the town being surrounded once by market gardens, so he was super keen and he knew all about Charles Dowding. Um, the four acre slice was taken off a larger conventionally farmed arable field. We signed the lease in October 2021 and we were presented with a totally bare canvas. Um, a soil food specialist named Eddie Bed Bailey um, sent soil samples off for us to be analysed and look at the biology under the microscope. Although there wasn't anything too worrying in the chemistry, the, the pH was good. The soil contained only a few types of bacteria with no fungi or other beneficial microbes present. We also had only 2.5% carbon uh, present due to decades of plowing. We had an issue with compaction due to the use of tractors and were advised to subsoil. Um, we'll forever be grateful to Eddie for advice uh, for subsoiling before we started building the beds because there were still little pockets on the farm that the soil subsoiler didn't break and these are literally impenetrable. Um, it's crazy how yeah solid that bit is. But um, so with the help of some of the photos you can see of these volunteers um, and Molly and her boyfriend, uh, we began to lay cardboard to suppress any weed seeds from germinating and made 30 meter long beds topped with well rotted horse mulch manure, sorry, which was free from a lady in the new forest. Um, we uh, had been introduced to the tree council by Colin, who has been working with them to lengthen and widen hedgerows in the local areas. We had wanted a hedgerow to surround the four acre plot um, to provide some new habitat forage and eventually act as a windbreak to the extremely flat and exposed site. Uh, the tree council enabled us to plant over 4,000 mixed native species in the hedgerow and over 100 fruit trees. 
we now have a new this year this new uh, hazel planting to form a coppice area for uh, we'll use them for hazel poles um, we will use them for chippings for the paths and to compost um, amazingly despite the drought last year 95 percent of the hedgerow has survived and we only lost two of the fruit trees I would say it presently looks really healthy. It's very lush and green. Um, if you do the next slide, please. Um, and it's uh, home to many insects. So I started propagation of seedlings in February of 2022 and used the CSA model, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Um, I chose this model as it enabled us to have a clearer picture of how many people we were growing for initially and the safety net, for, net of a ready made market. Um, so customers pay up front where possible or monthly, if not, so that we had a dedicated, we had dedicated funds for potting compost, seed and equipment in advance of the season. So with the CSA, they commit to paying no matter what happens, if the harvest or the weather interferes or doesn't go to plan um they still pay um so they're truly supporting a local grower to get to understand what can happen in a season um in return they receive a weekly box of different vegetables up to 10 different varieties and there's herbs as well and they're encouraged to pick up their box from the farm to see what's happening and to get involved with volunteer days if they like um when we have a glut, the community benefits with extra produce, but they also run the risk of crops failing. Um, we will be hosting a summer party for the CSA members finally this year to thank them for their support, encourage them to continue a relationship with the land. And many of them have returned from, most of them in fact have returned from uh, last year's sign up. Um, as well, we ran a crowdfunder that gained um, us funds to buy a polytunnel, a potting shed and many tools. The Ringwood community has been like ridiculously supportive and it continues to be so. We, uh, we, we attribute much of the success of the first year um, to the microbial compost teas that we sprayed on and the microbes in the organic matter present in the old horse muck. Um, the very hot, dry spring and summer could have been disastrous, yet the compost mulch kept soil below covered and it didn't dry out. Um, also, the breaking of the compaction will have helped the water to travel up as well as downwards, which I hadn't really thought about before, which is crazy. Um, so that's some of our vegetables there. And there's Molly with some of the tree councils, um, many, many bundles of whips that we received. And you can see that the first plantings of the, the whips, which doesn't really look like much, just looks like sticks. <laughs> um, so the next slide, please. Um, so. The whole of the four acres was transform transformed by midsummer with nearly every inch of the land covered in a huge variety of plants, photosynthesizing, which is them feeding the soil. The volunteers that first help us um, continue to join us and many people visited to help and learn. Um, we have provided last year veg boxes to 35 local families for 28 weeks without buying in any extra veg as some farms do and we supplied three shops and two restaurants we've got more of those this year um, the feedback has been truly wonderful um, we have made so many friends and a community has uh, formed on on and off the farm actually we are honestly blown away by how much people love to come and want to support us and, and this small piece of land uh, we have many types of visitors, including, including some home ed pupils, and we've got uni students from the local university who are studying ecology and wildlife doing placements with us. Um, and you can see some of the little visitors that are coming to the farm. Um, yeah, so if you could do the next slide, please. Um, those who have been picking up veg boxes or volunteering have commented on how peaceful they find the farm. Uh, we have many families visits with kids who never normally eat vegetables. The parents have often said this, that I'm um, happy to try things as we walk around. We wouldn't have been able to achieve all that we have without the support of the local people. I, I genuinely think that is, it's been a really spe special um, and heartening uh, process over the last year. Obviously, incredibly hard work, but it's been so worthwhile. Um, and I think yeah, I feel like I'm seeing so many more of these projects and more people getting in contact with us who um, are doing the same thing or starting similar projects. 
Um, I personally feel passionately about the local food movement and that perhaps we can imagine a future where food, more food is grown uh, in the UK for the UK. Um, of course, our project is just a drop in the ocean and uh, we ourselves have a long way to go and our soil health has a long, long way to go to be repaired and, and healthy and fully functioning. Um, but we we feel happy to be on, um, part of this community and, and talking to people face to face outside in the fresh air and surrounded by plants, which they all really love. Um, indigenous folk around the world who have not forgotten how to work with nature speak of reciprocity and that we can't just keep taking without mindfully giving back and appreciating the land, not just seeing it as a commodity, but as our home. We hope that there are enough people willing to make real change and fast so that we can heal our soils and our food system and hopefully try and help with um, climate change and carbon sequestering also. So yeah, we've just got into the next year now, the new season. Um, again, it's lots of hard work, there's new challenges, but everybody's returning and uh, we're, we're positive for the year ahead. We just need to make sure there's not too many slugs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I said, is that wonderful? That's such a fantastic a stor uh, story and what you've achieved in such a short time, really, because I think the space is yours for 15 years. Is that right? Yeah, 14 now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just see the picture of that aubergine and you can really um just just fantastic what you do so um we'll come back in a minute to to questions but now we're going to um move you you said kate that you had no background in horticulture agriculture and ni neither did george i don't think um no yeah it, it seems to be a theme yeah so tell us a bit about your journey and how you got to where you are from being a tv and radio presenter uh so yeah, I, I kind of I fell into TV and radio presenting. Uh, I was I was managing bands. Uh, it had gone quite well for a few years. Was going less well. A friend of mine said, uh, actually a guy I owed I owed some rent to at a TV production company, uh, and he just won a big tender to do to get a lot of kind of uh, it's like VJing they call it that like MTV style stuff. Anyway, did that. Did it for a few years. Said I was said I was gonna you know I was just doing a bit of presenting whilst I was figuring out what I was gonna do with my life, uh, and then. Um, and then and managed to kind of get myself into Russell Brand's slipstream uh, and, and got a brilliant agent. And very quickly, kind of within a couple of years, my career really took off. Um, and, I'm, and, and I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever, if you're, if you're not there with any real purpose and you're just following the money uh, in, in the media, that means you end up on, on what they call shiny floor shows, which are like Saturday night TV, basically, um, which is which is like game shows. Um, and uh, and it was you know of course you know young man making you know like lots of money and and you know fame and adulation and all the rest of it it's, you know it's it's great and 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 it looks fun and uh, and it's fine for a bit, um, but then the kind of the reckoning kicks in and you know why am I here and what's the point in all of this and did my spirit get drawn down from from the you know intergalactic you know mess to 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 or, or to come down into this mess and be a be a game show host i don't think so you know um and uh and so yeah i i the, the riots happened in 2011 i think um and i had managed to kind of you know by by i don't know whatever luck good fortune i'd kind of managed to get myself into the tiny subset of people who basically had everything and life was you know, my life was glorious um and uh and when I was looking around, you could see that there was just chaos and there was a real serious, you know, line as there is to this day. And I'm sure as there's, there's always been, but, but you know, the, the haves and the have nots. And, um, and I realized that it, I, it, not only did I want to try and do something about that, but actually at that moment in time, by making uh, kind of, you know, fairly low rent television, I, I was not only not contributing, but I was also... Uh, complacent in selling distraction to poor people because when you go into a room full of very wealthy people you find out very quickly that none of them are watching game shows uh, and if you go into a room full of working class people a lot of them are watching game shows you know and and so um yeah it, it, it wasn't okay and uh, and i rang uh, 
my dad rang me one morning actually uh, and, and I was in my nice house with my nice car and everything it was great and everybody was telling me how well my life was going and uh, and I said I said he said how are you son and I was just like oh, I feel really empty and I know that's a cliche and I don't want to feel you know I feel like I should um you know, I, I don't want to feel ungrateful, but yeah, I just feel like this is all pointless. And he was like, what? and I was like, well, you know what? And he was like, game show host, not a very serious guy in the big scheme of things, is he? You know, and just there was there went my world. Um, so he could have told me that, you know, 10 years ago, or whatever, dad. And he was like, we well, having a really good run of it, son, you know? Um, and and so pretty much there and then I did a kind of eat, love, pray. And I called my agent. I said, I'm not coming back for the next series. And I put my house on the market and I got rid of all worldly goods. And I went off looking for redemption. And I did all the kind of, you know, I went to nature, actually, which is, which is you know, I, I think a fairly good starting point. Um, I spent a lot of time in the jungles, in the mountains, doing lots of plant medicine, trying to figure out my role in all of this. Didn't really was definitely looking for a guru. Didn't really find what I was looking for. Uh, so I thought, oh, what well, to hell with it? I'm going to go to Ibiza and just have a nice summer. Um, and so I went to Ibiza and I walked into a nightclub and I got introduced uh, to this this fellow called Andy Cato, who's Cato, who's now my business partner. Um, and he he was DJing, um, but he had a look of like real real uh, tiredness about him. Uh, beyond just partying and uh, and I, I I was talking to him and I just said but what's going on in your life and he said um uh, and I think it's probably a kind of world first for a conversation of this sort in a nightclub he said um I've actually just sold all the publishing rights which is effectively the, a musician's pension uh, all the publishing rights to my future uh, royalties and I've bought a, a hundred hectare farm down in Gascony in the southwest of France and I'm trying to figure out how you do wheat production properly um that if you'd have given me a thousand guesses at what was what was making him look so bedraggled, that wasn't wouldn't be one of them. Um, and I'm sure, as we've all had at points in our life, when when somebody looks you in the eye and they just tell you their truth and they tell you it with that level of conviction that you know it's just like that thing's real. Um, I pretty much on the spot said, "This is great. It's exactly what I've been looking for. I'm going to help you." Um, and as you say, you know, I had I had no understanding of I, I didn't really know what he was talking about, to be honest with you. Um, but I, but I believed in him, and I was like, I'm going to help this man. And um, and so uh, at the end of the summer, I drove uh, back through Spain and into France to where his farm was, and went and met his family, and saw the farm, and saw what he was trying to do, and sh- saw the scale of the whole thing, and was blown away. And and uh, and so began what now, ten years on, has 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 morphed into this thing, Wild Farm, uh, and we are we're a group of regenerative farmers um, working up and down the country. We're we're we still have all the original farmers we work with in, in France. There's 13 over there, and I think we're up to about 50 here in the UK, um, as far up as Cumbria and as, as far down as um, as uh, as Cornwall. And yeah, we're, we're growing predominantly wheat at the moment uh, in a way that, that not only produces better crops but also prioritises soil health. And um, and yeah, and that, and 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 he uh, kind of kicked a thing off on in me where I was, you know, I knew something was wrong and I knew the system was broken. Uh, and I, I felt nature kind of calling me, um, but didn't really know that, that, that actually our only kind of irrefutable thing that binds all people, even those who are stuck in deep conflict that's maybe gone on for centuries, is our mutual interdependence on the well-being of the planet. And so if we are going to have a starting point for like, how do we turn the ship around, then actually I think our, our, us all looking at nature and seeing how we can all get together and do that, that might be the bit that, that crosses the the boundaries and the divisions and and straighten things out a bit. Sorry, I froze there, George, for a minute. My 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 connectivity is uh, it, this is an incredible story. Tell tell us what exactly what Wild Farmed is. So yeah, we're, we're we're a we're a regenerative uh, food business. Uh, we're a group of of, of, of regenerative farmers uh, working in in the UK and in France. Uh, I think we're we're the only group of regenerative farmers working to a third party audit. So we're audited by Control Union, um, and and yeah, I mean, uh, obviously I'm a bit of an evangelist for it, but you know, like regenerative agriculture, as far as I can see, it, if done properly, is the solution to many of our problems. Um, and so if we can find a way to increase biodiversity, sequester more carbon, um, uh, you know, reduce or mitigate against floods uh, and produce really high quality food, like 
like to have to have this kind of catch all. It, it's an incredible thing, and 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 we've been spending. Well, Andy spent the last fifteen years trying to figure out how you could do that at scale. Obviously, Regen is is almost. Um, uh, you know, people perceive it to be a kind of mum and pop cottage industry style thing because it's effectively, you know, it's by and large, it's, it's going back to a lot of the ancient practices that have been going on forever. Uh, and, and I suppose all we're trying to do now is add some modern technology into that and, and figure out how you do it at scale. You know, Andy had spent eight years building this beautiful, what could be regarded as a kind of pin-up version of a regenerative farm in, in France. Um, they, they'd gone from 0.5% organic matter, you know, really depleted soil health, been, been, uh, had 80 years of conventional maize, just, you know, smashing the soil biology to bits, um, managed to get that coming back to life, integrated with, 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 um, with cows. Um, uh, and was supplying all the local schools, was supplying the um, the local restaurants. They had the first bread queue in the town since 1945, which is no big thing for an Englishman. Uh, he was the first ever uh, non-Frenchman to become a Chevalier de Merit de l'Agricole, which is basic farming night. Um, so yeah, like kind of huge, like amazing thing that he did. And 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 then of course uh, Ed and I, who's the third uh, guy in Wild Farm, we went over there uh, on a trip. And and we were like, this is amazing, Andy. But like, why don't we zoom out for a minute? Um, and actually, you know, whilst it's brilliant, um, what we've got here is you've got this 200 odd acres of, of this kind of green oasis, but it's really just a postage stamp. And if you look 500 clicks in every direction, it's just brownfield factories. So like, great that you did it and great that we got this bit of land back together. But like, if we're really going to change stuff, how do we figure out how to do this at scale? And that's been the kind of, uh, the, the 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 quandary that we've been facing every day for the last eight years, really, I guess. But you've persuaded so many other farmers to, uh, you know, jo join the movement, if you like. I mean, why why are they joining it so enthusiastically? Do you think what's in it for them? Because it isn't easy. Yeah, I think. Um, it's interesting. You know, we, we we've kind of uh, uh, so. We've just developed this thing called the, the Wild Farm Regenerative Standards, uh, which for the first time we've got real consensus amongst our whole cohort. And if you can imagine, like over on, on one far side, uh, you've got you've got the kind of uh, radical regenerative guys who were desperate to have a banner to come under. So when we turned up, they were like, "Fantastic! Like we're super up for this!" And they're 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 amazing, and they're kind of. Uh, they're the lifeblood of the whole thing. Um, and then we've got guys uh, in the middle who are organic farmers, a lot of big, uh, you know, like Helen Browning uh, is one of our farmers and John Pawsey is one of our farmers. Um, and they are looking at what, you know, like they're, they're looking at an alter alternative routes for how we could be doing stuff, you know, because although we are technically not organic, um, we are, you know, same destination, different road, you know, so so they're trialing bits with us to see if, if that might be something, you know, obviously, you know, organic has been around for 70 years. Um, it's done amazing things. And 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 uh, but unfortunately, at the moment, we're less than two percent of agricultural land is is, is farmed organically. And so, uh, you know there's there's obviously some resistance in the marketplace uh, then you've got we've got conventional guys with a with a capital c a lot of them you know like big history you know of, of, of you know being sprayers their their whole careers um and a lot of them are just finding that it's it's not stacking up anymore you know every year they're looking at their fields and they're getting less and less yield and they're having to put more and more chemicals on and every year the chemicals are work, are costing more and their yield their decreasing yield is is they're getting less and less for it um, and so they're just coming to us rather than a, from an ideological perspective. They're just saying, this thing doesn't stack up for me anymore. Have you got an alternative? You know, and actually I, I just ha I had a kind of moment. It's not it's nothing particularly profound, but I had uh, this kind of uh, like, like, like bit of clarity a few weeks ago. And, you know, when we first started out and you're looking, you're, you're thinking about your business, you know, kind of from top down, you're thinking about where are the tension points going to be? At the beginning, we were really worried. And I suppose, you know, we had to start with them anyway, because you've got to start, you know, well in advance. But we were really worried about all the kind of cultural uh, baggage that would go for the farmers. So, you know, breaking these traditions and all the rest of it. Um, but actually, when you sit back from it, you know, by and large, uh, and rightly so, farmers feel that they've, you know, a pretty disgruntled bunch, and they feel they're not, they, they've not been treated properly and treated fairly. Um, and so, if you're trying to encourage 
any group of people to come with you on a journey, if the starting point is most of them aren't very happy with where they're at right now, like that's not the toughest group of people to get across to your way of thinking. Whereas if you come over to the food service and the supermarkets and all the rest of it, and you're basically going to them and saying, listen, it feels like you might have an extra 15% in the deal, guys. I'm going to need that back so I can give it back to the farmers so we can get this thing straightened out. And they're like, I don't know about that. I feel, I feel like I've got that 15% right now. So, you know, actually, the, the, getting the farmers on board has been considerably easier than we thought it was going to be. Um, and now we've just got to convince the, 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 um, the, the, the food the supermarkets, et cetera, and, and the big food guys that, that they, need to, they need to put their hand in their pocket. Yeah. So you you also you've missed out a bit of your career. You spent a chunk of your time. I know you're very concerned, as Kate is, about um, the younger generation, not only engaging them with outdoor learning, but getting them into careers. There's a million careers out there that young people could go for. They never hear about. Um, so tell us about about your your grow. Yeah. So so uh, kind of in the middle of all of that somewhere. I don't know quite where it happened. I I had this. Um, I was like, I know I need to help. I know I need, I know I need to be in service and I know I need to do something. And Wild Farm was always kind of bubbling along in the background, but, but you know, we knew it was a long game because at the beginning, Andy really was just figuring it out one step at a time, you know, and it didn't ever look like, oh, wow, this could potentially be a kind of game changing organization. So that was, that was kind of poodling along. Um, and, and I was just thinking, what am I going to do every day? And I was throwing myself into all kinds of community work and, and a lot of it looking at kind of disenfranchised, disengaged groups of people, but very definitely looking at it from, from, from a kind of people perspective. Um, and a friend of mine who'd written uh, numerous books on plant medicine, he was coming to the UK because he'd just written a new book. Uh, this is probably, I don't know, six years ago, maybe. Uh, and the book was called How Soon Is Now? Um, and I... Um, uh, he, he sent me the book and said, oh, will you interview me for this for, for like, you know, when I come and do my thing and an evening with the publishers and all the rest of it. And I didn't really, I was like, yeah, no problem, man. Like, I've read his other books. And I thought, anyway, this book comes along. It's nothing to do with plant medicine. And it's to do with the ecological mega crisis that is looming. And of course, it's in our everyday vernacular now. And it's all over the newspapers and just stop oil and all the rest of that. But six years ago, it was still page 17, 18 in the newspaper, you know, so then all of a sudden, I sit down to read this book, and for the first and only time, I sat and I read the, this book from cover to cover, and I was just like, at the end of it, I was like, "Oh no, this is terrible!" And what, like, basically everything else I care about is arbitrary because if we don't sort the planet out, like, there's 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 nothing else left, you know. So I was like, "How are we going to remedy that?" Uh, and I was I was like, "Right, I I we need to set up a kind of Jedi training camps for eco warriors, and they won't be called eco warriors; that'll just be the default, basically." Um, and and uh, I'd been going. My friend had become a head teacher at a great big school in in North London called the Totteridge Academy, and I've been going there a lot with this kind of view to like, I've got to help. I don't know what to do, but I've got to do something. Uh, and uh, and then finally, I was like, "That's it. This is where I'm going to do the Jedi camp." So I called him up. And, and I said, I said, let me, I want to come and pitch you this idea. So I pitched him the idea and he said, well, as it happens, um, uh, we've got a, a, a six acre field adjacent to the school that we, we, we don't have. We were going to make it into an AstroTurf, honestly, the madness that goes on in the world. But anyway, they were going to make a, a grass field into an AstroTurf. Uh, but unfortunately, they didn't have the money and it had just been sitting there idle for the last 11 years. And I was like, that's it. That's my space. And so began Grow uh, and, and Grow. Uh, is to this day it's a you know it started off uh, as a kind of six acre agroecological farm and we're growing all the, a lot of the food for the school and for the local community and we're getting the kids outside and teaching them how to how to grow their own food but also more than that connecting with nature and then also um you getting used to being in nature it's quite interesting our school sits right at the end of the northern line so it's, it's literally the first fields of the of, of the green belt uh it, you know compared to the inner cities this is incredibly incredibly kind of um you know uh, you know kind of green natural spaces and yet a lot of the kids who live on the adjacent state the only time they're in nature is when they walk through the path to get to the school and it's a few hundred meters and that's it you know um and so how do we start normalizing being back in nature, this thing that's literally sitting on their doorstep and getting kids to be comfortable in it? You know, and, and, and I, you know, I remember in the first few years before we had any kind of, you know, kind of momentum going, 
Um, you know, a lot of the kids, you'd spend, you know, 15 minutes them telling you about all the different reasons why they hated uh, being outside in the mud and the dirt and they couldn't do it and it just wasn't for them and blah, 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 blah. And then 15 minutes later, they'd be covered in mud and they'd be hanging out of a tree and they'd be like, this is the best thing ever, sir, you know, and you're like, oh, wow, there you go. It's deep innate in all of us, you know. So, um, so yeah, it grow, grows there, it con- you know, it continues to roll on. I think we're probably six years in. Um probably got a couple of hundred kids a week going through the program and 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 lots of uh, lots of kind of local groups using it outside of school hours um you've even so, got yeah, a mushroom academy haven't you we've got a mushroom academy had we had the first accredited uh, mycology course in the uk i think uh, it might still be the only one i don't know but anyway it was it, it was it was of its time uh, that that was uh, founded by a brilliant guy called called darren springer uh, who's who's a mycologist brilliant mycologist so so yeah, yeah, it's been it's been really it's been it's been amazing, and 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 then you know and kind of out of that, and then wild farm started to get serious. You realise it's all one thing, you know. It's all you bet, you know. If if we're gonna if we're gonna change stuff, I think you've got to change with kids because short of the building being on fire, trying to get adults to go at the same direction at the same time, it's very very difficult, you know. Um, and so we need to hardwire all the kids coming through. Um, and, and get them to have a different operating system. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble. I can see, I can see Kate nodding there. I'm going to unmute you, Kate, and hear what, because you talked about young people. And I know you have lots of young people. I mean, are we doing enough to get young people involved and engaged, do you think? No, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, it's not <laughs> as a given. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, like I said, it's not wasn't anything to do with my, my education. We never talked about nature at all um i know there was there's something coming through with gcses isn't there that they're going to bring in some sort of nature studies there's a long way off okay i heard about that news but i don't really listen to the news so there you go um so yeah no it's just i totally agree it has to start with grassroots and with kids because um they're not being educated by their schools they're not being educated by their parents because their parents have lost the connection too so it's just trying to get back what like George said is like innate in all of us I believe anyway I do genuinely think that it is part of being a human like we are animals too and that we should have this wonderful experience of getting to know our natural world again and then you'll look after it. If you care about it, then you'll, you'll you'll try and do something to save it rather than just ignoring it or seeing it as like either not seeing it or seeing it, like I said, as a commodity, unfortunately. Yeah. But, so we're in National Hedgerow Week and we have talked a little bit about hedgerows, but and we're seeing lots of, of enthusiasm from farmers, it has to be said, to uh, grow hedgerows. And there's even more interest as well in cities, which is great because they're, they they perform an incredible function in um in the cities but in terms of of land use i mean looking looking a little bit at, at tom here um that sometimes there's there's that uh competition between agriculture and the environment and planting trees and hedgerows do it well any thoughts from any of you on on how farmers can balance food production with um looking after the environment, making space for the environment. I know that's what wild farming and Kate's all about, but um, go, go for it, Tom. I think one of the one of the things I've been trying to do to support support ministers with the um with the land use framework is to get out of London, get out of Westminster. Uh, as far away as possible, and um, and speak to um, the groups of land managers, landowners, from the kind of market gardens through to the great estates, including the estates that um, the UK government owns, like the Defence Estate, which is absolutely enormous. Um, uh, and frankly, every time you go out, you meet uh, landowners who uh, whose understanding of uh, what needs to be done to meet these big national objectives is far greater than anyone you could talk to um, uh, um, who's working in and around government. That won't surprise any of you. Um, the one thing that has surprised me is uh, the extent to which the kind of deep knowledge, uh, the really old knowledge um, uh, in communities and on some of those estates is being kind of 
restored uh, again. There was uh, um, we were down in in Devon uh, on the Clinton Devon um, estates, which um, sort of runs down the X River, um, and they had uh, actually had to go into uh, some some rooms in uh, um, uh, the farming cottages that hadn't been opened for I mean you know who knows generations maybe um, and pull out some uh, 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 paintings of the estate to to work through where it might be suitable to replant hedgerows because they didn't have they hadn't kept a record um, of where they had previously been and wanted to be able to make an informed judgment about land suitability and it's that kind of that kind of deep community or institutional knowledge that has to be kind of melded with uh, um, the uh, the higher tech uh, spatial data led uh, ecosystem services based uh, um, evidence uh, to get these big transformations happening to work out what ought to be happening where I mean that's a relatively technocratic answer other colleagues on the um, the line will have better answers about how it actually happens in places with people. So it's, it's interesting. One of the questions that's come up from the audience is, is, is it says, George, this is Caroline, says, George mentioned that um, you started at 0.5%. What's what's your land at now? And, you know, in terms of record keeping and also Kate as well, you you gave a figure for yours. What, how, how are you doing some years on? Uh, so uh, on Andy's farm in, in France, uh, the last check, I think, was it was up to about three. Um, and that's after the best part of a decade, I guess, probably. Um, and and but but to be totally honest with you, you know, he he was in this kind of because he knew he wanted to be organic when he first started, and and coming off the back of this really depleted soil, he got into this war of attrition, and he's kind of like he's a he's an engineer by by trade he's not by trade but by mind anyway um, and he started to like he was building all these like crazy fly mo contraptions kind of mad max things on scaffolding poles and trying to get in and, and sort all the, the docks and the thistles out um, and obviously it wasn't working uh, it's like whack-a-mole but on a huge scale and uh, and then and then uh, he was he was actually going to buy his daughter a book and they pretty much got to the point where he was like, I think I'm going to have to throw the towel in. And we're going to, because you, when you first, particularly if you're a first generation farmer, all your initial uh, checks that you're writing got a lot of zeros on the end, you know? So he pretty much ironed out all his money. Um, and he was going to look for a book for his daughter. I think it was an Enid Blyton book and wrongly labeled uh, in there um, was this book called An Agricultural Testament by Albert Howard. Who's literally who's and if anybody I mean if you're into this kind of thing like that's a great place it's a it's a wonderful book he's a wonderful man he he was kind of around with um you know Rodale was a was a was a contemporary of his or maybe even a student of his and he was you know big pals with Lady Balfour and you know they, they figured all this stuff out you know hundred years ago and and probably some people had figured it out several hundred before that but um uh the, the um. Yeah, the, the thrust of this book was was that you know plants and animals have developed over millennia working in symbiosis, and when you have them together, then you have a you have a perfect solution. And when you separate them, you create myriad problems. And so, Andy was like, "Oh God, do I need to get cows?" So you know, went back to his long suffering wife Jo, and was just like, "One last roll of the dice, babe. You know, we're going to get loads of cows." And you know, bearing in mind at this point, he never even had a, a pet. Um, it was quite a big jump, but but you know, within kind of nine months of the cows being on the land. You know, hey, presto, the dots and the thistles were gone and the balance had come back and equilibrium had come back and the soil biology was on its way. Fantastic. And Kate, have you seen changes? Uh, I mean, we've seen the health of the crops last year, but we haven't tested again for um, how much uh, carbon or organic matter we have present. Um, I mean, we've just been advised that it's a slow process. It's going to take a long time. I mean, that's that's the issue with everyone, isn't it? Like we've got a lot to catch up with um, and it's going to take a lot. But we're trying to speed up nature um, and, of course, yeah, animals. And um, as someone phrased, or I don't know what film it was from, we've got to keep poop in the loop. It's using what's already... Uh, you know the natural processes and, and putting that back down on the on the land we, we cannot sort of separate these things out and think that we know better it's got a system that works so we've got to, we've got to work with that i'm going to call will in because i know that will's been scanning the the questions that have been coming in um from the audience will any that you want to 
uh, put to our panelists? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a few in the in the uh, question answer box, and um, one of them is to you, Kate, and it's what compost do you do you use to, uh, for seed sowing and young plant growing, and have you thought about producing your own? Yeah, we're definitely trying to get on the road to do our own. We're going to be building a Johnson soup um, uh, to use for next year. It takes a whole year for that to break down into what hopefully will be great potting compost, which is a 50-50 mix of carbon and uh, green. And um, But at the moment, we've been using one called Pete's Peat Free, um, and he puts his through um, a worm farm. He puts his compost through a worm farm, so there's loads of tiny worms in there, and there's lots of worm casting and all the uh, microbes in there, and it it's uh, it's doing a great job at the minute. But we also, yeah, we use microbial teas and mixed in with those. We'll water those onto the plants as they go out with the seedling trays. Okay, brilliant. Hey. Um, we've got another another one um, more aimed at yourself, Tom, which is, are there any figures available to indicate how much agricultural land is poor quality for food production, which is, you know, would, is, would be presumably be the better land to take out uh, of food production? And also, what about planting trees that can be harvested for foods, uh, you know, your fruit trees and nuts and things like that? Yeah, thanks, Will. And I think this question was from Loretta. Um, Loretta, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, so yes, there is a lot. Um, there's a lot of data out there. The um, question is how you use it and how you uh, find the insights that are actually meaningful for um, uh, landowners and land managers. Um, I think. I mean, the key thing is that policy, and this is the purpose of the land use framework document and the work on local nature recovery strategies, which is another big uh, um, thing within my team in Defra. Um, uh, is that we have to enable people to make uh, use of that incredibly diverse natural capital in England to make a virtue of that on their on their land. Now, if you go to the agricultural land classification grade grades that are uh, um, published by by Defra, you can get a bit of a view of that, um, but it's incomplete. It's partial. It, it often tells you something that's very different to what. Um, uh, a landowner, a land manager on that land will tell you you can get the best quality land, uh, grade one land that ought to, ought to be the most versatile land in the country. Um, and farms will tell you that it's become a noose around their neck because it floods every year um, and the peat's washing straight off their land because of their management practices. So you have to you have to take that observed data, the, the data from people managing the land, mix it with um uh the national data sets uh find a way of making that usable one final thing on that there is uh defra is a is a very kind of like data evidence-led department we have a natural capital and ecosystem services assessment project and that is a really exciting effort to take all the data sets that flow into government and make them publicly available um i'd urge you to take a look at that um and some of the products coming out of that which are awesome I think there is a, a question, isn't there, for Tom, for you about... Um... I can pick up the other two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why don't you pick up the others at the same time? Yeah, great. So from um, Tom Pearson, uh, Tom, you asked about agroforestry. Um, uh, yes, it has a critical role to play. Um, uh, but one of the key things here is um, delivering multifunctionality at a landscape scale. Now that's like deep jargon, what I mean by that. Um, we have to... Um, uh, where the land is suitable, uh, uh, work out how we can achieve a mix of uh, carbon sequestration, high value nature habitat uh, and farming. Now, that won't be appropriate in every space, but uh, there are many types of land where that is appropriate and there are landowners and land managers who want to make that choice. Um, lots of people have been speaking to us in this work about um, agroforestry. If you take a look at the recently published um, Net Zero Plan, there are ambitious um, targets in there for agroforestry, the challenge for the land use framework is to make sure that we're clarifying how you can also be delivering other things uh, and how that links into uh, um, incentives. Jill, um, uh, you asked a question I can't answer um, about uh, what, uh, what happens to the land use framework with the change of government. As a civil servant, you serve the government of the day. Um, I can't give you a straight answer to that question. I think the, uh, the things that you should look to are the uh, legislative basis for this uh, for this work. We have uh, very uh, um, stretching uh, targets across climate and nature. Um, 
uh, and there isn't a huge amount of wiggle room in meeting uh, those those targets. But that's all I can say on that, I'm afraid. So we've got a question. Uh, th thanks, Tom. We've got a question here for Kate um, from, from John Barnett, who says, your project sounds really exciting. Will you be getting your hedges laid in the traditional way in due course? They could be ideal training hedges for people learning the craft. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, Colin Andrews, who I mentioned before that the Tree Council know very well, he's already been starting a tree laying project up in the New Forest and he's got a tree laying club, I think. So, yeah, once it's uh, in many years, I suppose, when it when it's big enough, we will definitely be we're looking to do that. Brilliant. That's great. And then there's one um, that talks a bit about a very practical question. How difficult and expensive is it to obtain insurance uh, to cover visiting school children onto a privately owned site? Um, it's been easy enough we managed to find one that works um like a forest school that's what we we use we we found one through a forest school practitioner um that covers all the public liability the things like uh any of the hazards like ponds and things or any of the tools that they'll be using so that we can have things like bushcraft and those sorts of things happening on site also fantastic Thank you so much. We're, co we're coming to the end um, of the session. It's been absolutely amazing to have all our panellists with us, um, you know, inspiring us not only for healthy growing, but healthy food, healthy hedgerows, just putting um, the soil back into shape and letting the world go on as it should. Um, if you'd like to learn more about hedgerows in National Hedgerow Week, I think that uh, we have put the, the link to National Hedgerow Week in the chat. I should say as well, I've, I've, I'm on page 35 of uh, typical, this book called Ravenous, um, which was published fairly recently by Henry Dimbleby, who was the co-founder of the restaurant tray, uh, chain Leon. And uh, Tom, I can see him nodding, was author of the government's national food strategy in 2001. So I'm only on page 37, but it's a great read. And uh, we'll put the link to that as well in the chat um tomorrow night there's another hedgerow session which uh is with people's trust for endangered species ian white if you want to learn about hedgerows and dormice then drop in tomorrow evening and then we've also got on thursday night um and uh a workshop about surveying and hedgerow surveying so another opportunity and again the link will be in the chat if you'd like to join one of those so thank you, huge, huge thank you to our panellists and a huge thank you uh, to our guests who have joined us this evening. Um, we hope the rest of your evening will be joyful and restful and we wish you for the rest of the week a really happy National Hedgerow Week and a happy Plant Health Week. So <laughs> goodbye from um, everybody here. Thank you very much.